together. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful uh, just for the opportunity on this Christmas Eve to reflect on the night when you were born. Uh, it was a long time ago, but it's very near to us. So God, give us eyes to see not just you in the manger, but you alive, living the life that we could not live, and then dying on the cross, a death that we would not die to atone for our sins and to secure for us everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, that you came. Thank you, Lord, that you came and that you love us so much. We honor you today. Your presence is here. Your people are here. There's no better place to be than among your people, remembering your birth and your life. So we thank you and we honor you. Speak to our hearts now from your word. Encourage us, prepare us even more for your coming again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you're, be, as you're being seated, would you just look at someone around you and say Merry Christmas? All right. Good. That sounded good. I am uh, just very grateful for the opportunity to worship with you all this Christmas Eve. And I, um, I don't know if I can say enough about what a wonderful privilege this is and uh, a privilege that certainly is afforded to me by God, but um, uh, God has used Pastor Brian Brookins in my life in such a tremendous, tremendous way, and uh, he had some very kind words to say about me. Um, I'm not just saying these in return, but I am so grateful for you, brother. I am so grateful for the ways that uh, you have mentored me and taught me, and um, I'm a lot younger than you. But uh, I'm grateful for your leadership in my life. And over this church, Riverside Church, here we are, uh, a year, almost a year later um, from coming together as one. And uh, just what a wonderful opportunity to celebrate uh, this first Christmas together. God has done some wonderful things in the life of this church over the past year. I pray in each and every one of your lives and uh, now's the time to just celebrate who God is, what he has done, his coming, and not just his coming. During this Advent season, we've not just been celebrating his coming before, but his coming again. We live in anticipation of our Lord coming again and making all things new. Are you looking forward to that? Amen. And so, <clears throat> so it's wonderful to, to have gone through all... <coughs> Brian, can you throw me a water there? Uh, I was ready, bro. Um, so it's wonderful to have, to have gone through the Advent candles of love. I'm sorry, love today and then joy, peace, and hope that we find in our God. Today we're highlighting love. And as Brian said, I've got just a few minutes for this sermon. It's wonderful to be able to sing Christmas carols together. I hope when you go home, you'll sing some together there. How many of you all sing Christmas carols at your house together? All right. This is a challenge, okay? For those of you that don't, it's one time a year, all right? You can even put them on YouTube. You can put, put the picture up, and you guys can just do kind of karaoke style but whatever you do, it'd be great to sing some Christmas carols and, and maybe even go to Matthew chapters 1 and 2, Luke chapters 1 and 2, and also read the Christmas story during this time. But we've been in a series in 1 John called Love Came Down. Past couple weeks, Brian has been focusing on the idea of love and preaching that. Last week was a wonderful 10-point sermon I don't know if I've ever seen that, but 
Brian is unique in that way, and he was able to do that in a timely and just so well-developed manner in which we've, we saw the attributes of God's love and the way that it works itself out in each and every one of us. But very briefly today, uh, from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 11, I want to read in your hearing John's admonition to each and every one of us concerning, again, the incarnation. And he says in verse 7 of 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, meaning if he loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. Some researchers asked some children uh, what their idea of love was. Chrissy, age six, said love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries <laughs> without making them give you any of theirs. <laughs> Amen. Terry, age four. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. <laughs> Danny, age seven, I like this one. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him <laughs> to make sure the taste is okay. <laughs> Selfish, selfless, sacrificial love. That's what that is, right? Uh, uh, Beth, you'll like this one. Beth, you there? Oh, okay. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. That's Mayan, age four. I like this one. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for, for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Love is a very basic human need. Um, I would have to say that we all need love. We all want the feeling of love, the, the experience of love. And because we're all different, uh, that experience is somewhat unique to each of us. But for most of us, to have another human being care about us, uh, provide affection and trust and protectiveness and attraction, that feels like love. We need that. Uh, but it is of great comfort to me, and it should be to you as well, that God is love. This is what John tells us in verse 8 of our text. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is is love. Uh, I need the love of another human being, but I, I also know that the love of any other human being is incomplete and is imperfect, right? Uh, because Brian's not love. David's not love. God is love. Amen? Amen? So if we're going to experience true love, perfect love, we're going to have to experience it from God. And, and might I say that, especially in the ways that our culture goes, I, I want to make a distinction. Uh, God is love is not the same thing as saying love is God, right? Um, the grass is green is not the same as saying green is grass, right? God defines and is what love is. And as 
Much as I need to receive love from other human beings, I need to experience the love of God. And I would submit to you that you need to experience the love of God. But God is a spirit. So if God is a spirit, how am I supposed to have this experiential uh, love of God coming from God? How does it show up for me? And John tells us this in this particular passage. He tells us first that God reveals his love to us through Jesus. God reveals his love to us through Jesus. In this is love, verse 9 says, in this the love of God, I'm sorry, was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. The word manifest means to be shown. It means to be revealed. It means to come out into the open, to not uh, be hid. It's kind of like when you hide your gifts in all of that wrapping paper. I'm not sure why we wrap gifts, right? And some of you all, some of you all, my wife does such a good job of this, and my daughter is learning as well. You just, they're so meticulous with the gift wrapping, and every corner, and, and the bow, and the ribbon, and when I get it, I just rip it open, right? I want to see what is revealed. <laughs> I want to reveal what is underneath that. And this is what God is doing. He's taking all of the mystery away and showing to us what his love is in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ being born and living and dying it is not just an example from God. It is a very real expression of the love of God to you, to me, to the entire world world. That's why John says in, in chapter 3, verse 16, for God, this is the way God loved the world. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. This is how the love of God was revealed to us in the incarnation, in the life, in the birth, and the life of Jesus Christ. You know, there are so many attributes that are in Scripture about God, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his self-existence, his infinite nature, his holiness, his righteousness. But John says that the attribute of love that is shown to us is in Jesus. The most significant way that God shows up to us is in the incarnation. And what John ties to that, the attribute that John ties to that is the attribute of love. And we start to get an idea of what love is according to God. It's nothing more precious to God the Father than God the Son. And yet for our sake, the Son is sent by the Father. And if you've ever wondered what love is, Scripture is telling us here, that's love. And the purpose of God revealing that love to us in Jesus was so that we would be able to live through him. Look at the last part of verse 9, and this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. First of all, we need to understand in Ephesians 2, it says that we as human beings, word of God tells us that we're born in sin, we're shaped in rebellion against God because of the fall. But Ephesians 2 says that we are dead in trespasses and in sins. All of us that are in here today with some inclination toward God, do you realize that it is because God has awakened your heart and your mind to even have a desire to know anything about him? Because we're born in sin and we're dead in our trespasses, but God sends his son in the form of Jesus Christ in the incarnation so that we would know as a human being, you can have an experience with God that is truly the love of God revealed to us. And when God sends Jesus and through his life and through his death, and when we believe in him, that love now awakens in us a desire to know more about him and to walk with him. That's what we learn actually from this next point 
What is it about that love that God gives to us in Jesus Christ that makes eternal and spiritual life possible? But before I talk about that, I want to say that your spiritual life is not just about waking you up. It's not just about waking you up. I love the fact that John says here that uh, God sends Jesus Christ, his son, so that we can live through him. And you know, what it, it brought into my mind is like, man, there's a lot of different things that we try to shape our lives around. You know, we might shape our lives around our job, and that becomes sometimes the most important thing to us our career. We might shape our lives even around our children. We love our children, but almost everything in our lives is shaped around them and how they're doing and how they feel about us. You might shape your life around uh, your relationship, your marriage, or lack thereof. But God wants us to live through Jesus live through Jesus, and to have Jesus living in us. It, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we have a, a term that people use nowadays, adjacent, right? Like they might say, um, uh, instead of you being healthy, it's kind of a joke, but instead of you being healthy, you're not necessarily eating a salad, uh, or you're eating a salad, but you got a bunch of blue cheese on there, and you got a bunch of other condiments on there that make the salad non-effective. You say, well, I'm not necessarily healthy, but I'm healthy adjacent, right? I'm, I'm just kind of right next to healthy, right? And, and I, I just feel like sometimes that's how we, we live our Christian lives, Jesus adjacent. And what Jesus wants is to be the absolute center of our lives. We're going to experience God in such a, God's love in such a remarkable way when we make Jesus the absolute center of our lives because Jesus came so that we might live through him, not just at the start, but throughout the entirety of our lives into eternity with Jesus forever. That is the goal. So I want us to just reflect on that and know that God sends or reveals his love through Jesus so that we might live through him. But what is it about that love that makes this spiritual and eternal life possible? Verse 10 says, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. John explains, love is this, God sent Jesus to take our place. That's what it means. The propitiation means that Jesus is the satisfaction He's the one that went to the cross for us. And you might say, well, hold on. I thought we were talking about Christmas. How did we get all the way to Easter, right? How did we get all the way to Easter? Well, the point is, without us understanding why Jesus came can sometimes cause us to just look at this as just another happy story. But Christmas is, is more than that. Jesus coming into the world is so that he would live a righteous life, and that he would die on the cross an atoning death, meaning that you could not go to the cross for yourself. And even if you did, it wouldn't be sufficient for all of your sins. But God comes down and lives a perfectly righteous life, and he goes to the cross and earlier in 1 John, it says he did not just die for us, but he died for the sins of the whole world so that anyone who desires to come to him because he has awakened his heart through his love, their hearts through his love, will come to him and receive complete forgiveness of their past, present, and future sins, and it sets them on a trajectory of eternity with him. This is what it means that Jesus has come, and God explains his love through Jesus. And John proclaims, listen, it's not that we loved God first. Whatever love we feel for God is because he loved us first, making it possible for us to love him. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us 
and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And then in verse 11, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And you know, this is not really just advice. When John says we also ought to love one another, it kind of sounds like it might be a little bit optional. But you remember Jesus? Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. It's a commandment. But notice that this commandment does not come without the power to achieve it. Jesus says, because I've loved you this way, then you ought to love one another. What does that mean? I, honestly, it, it means that times like this are very appropriate. When we can reflect on the love of God, something about us as human beings, we, we often forget. Uh, one of the, the children, I didn't read that one, but one of the children says that if you love someone, you should tell them often because people forget. A little five-year-old said that. We often forget. And now's an appropriate time to remember that God has loved us in this way. And if we're going to love others, how are we going to love them? Well, as I mentioned before, it's more than just the affection. It's more than just the closeness. It's more than just the protectiveness. If we're going to love one another, I think one of the things that we ought to let people know is that God sent his love by sending Jesus Christ. If you don't know that, it's unloving for me not to tell you that. And if you're here today and you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus was sent by God so that you could experience his love. And the love of God is the purest love that there could ever be because God defines what love is. If you're missing love, if you feel like maybe you've never experienced it, if you feel like it's somehow missing in your life, if you've experienced abuse, if you've experienced neglect, if you've experienced bad relationships, if you've experienced poverty and you're wondering if anybody cares about you, I want you to know that it's not just a story 2,000 years ago because Jesus is alive today and he is ready and he is willing to express God's love to you in a relationship with him that changes everything. Amen? And so if I'm going to tell anybody about the love of God, I tell them that Jesus has come. But I also want to tell them that Jesus has come to forgive your sins. He's come to forgive your sins. And you know, it's, in, it's, it's something that we as God's people can do with one another as well. Um, it's interesting that God will forgive us of all of our sins. But boy, you did something to me yesterday. And... <laughs> I got to think about it, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, what sacrifice are you bringing today um, so that I can think even deeply, more deeply about forgiving you? When God, even before we loved him, Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We have the opportunity to look at one another and share the love of God to share the love of Jesus with each other by forgiving each other, by finding out what needs do we have and seeking to meet those needs. That's what Jesus does with us. This, this is the opportunity that we have this Christmas. So may God continue to bless us and help us to understand in his word that he came down, and when he came down, changed everything because he gives us the right to have a, a completely new life, completely forgiven of our sins. You remember in, in 1 John 2, it says that even as children of God, if we sin, our God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins 
because of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I just want us to bow our heads at this time. God has been so good to us. He's been so faithful to us. He's been so loving to us. He's been so kind to us. And uh, we just sang, O Holy Night. We're about to, uh, about to sing another carol as we light some candles right after we have uh, the lighting of the Christ candle. And let me just pray for us. God, grateful to you for your coming. I pray that you would give us, continue to give us eyes to see. Give us an imagination, Lord, of you in a cold stone manger. And, and looking at you is a mother, Mary, who had never been married, never had any intimate relationships with a man. And Joseph, her husband, who married her upon the assurance of an angel that that which is within her is conceived by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. And they're looking down at a miracle, completely unable to understand all that that means. And we have now, Lord, the, uh, we have the, the opportunity to look back in time and see what that means, that this was the expression of your love to us. That, that Jesus would go on to preach the gospel and live a spotless, perfect life. And that when he died on the cross, it would be so that me, that I, that we would be able to have our sins forgiven completely. And not just that, that we would have the righteous life of Jesus given to us. And so God, help us to reflect on that. And to leave this place learning how to love our brothers, our sisters, our co-workers, our children, our parents, our neighbors, even our enemies, as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>